and welcome to the Smart Growth America National Complete Street Coalition's webinar on creating safer streets with demonstration projects. My name is Emiko Atherton, and I am director of the National Complete Streets Coalition, which is a program of Smart Growth America, and I'm excited to be here to talk about uh, these demonstra demonstration projects that were done as part of our Safe Streets Academy. Before I start, I'd just like to give some background on to what the Safe Streets Academy was and how we wound up with the projects we have today. Last spring, we were fortunate at the National Complete Streets, during, uh, the National Complete Streets Coalition to be awarded one of the Road to Zero Innovation Grants. The Road to Zero Coalition is a group of organizations from around the country are com who are committed to zero traffic fatalities. Um, as part of this program, they gave out eight innovation grants last year to really what they called moonshot projects. What are different ways that we can start to address zero fatalities? Um, and what we proposed was the Safe Streets Academy, which was really a chance to work with three communities across the United States on not only the, the best engineering countermeasures for uh, pedestrian for pedestrian safety, but to actually go ahead and have those cities do moon moonshot programs and uh, try out what they were learning on the ground. We opened up a competitive application project, um, and we received applications from well over uh, 35 communities within the United States, and we ended up picking the cities of Orlando, the Lexington Fayette Urban County Government of Kentucky, and the city of South Bend, because they had really shown they were at a point where they were committed to reducing pedestrian and bicycle, as well as all traffic fatalities, but they were really looking for, you know, what are the next steps to take us over kind of where we are um, and try out new things. The way this program work, worked is that we actually, as a group of three cities, got together three times in person to really start to look at what are proven safety countermeasures and how can you implement those through creative placemaking and community engagement, as well as through street design. We met once in the city of Orlando, once in the city of Lexington, and once in the city of South Bend. And so there was a lot of peer learning involved with these interactive exercises. We also did six distance learning modules where we really heard from practitioners on the state of the art best practices on curbside management, freight management, automated vehicles, and, <clears throat> and smart cities. Um, so with that said, um, we had the cohort, so we selected, we had each city select a cohort of 10 people who really touch the transportation process, but maybe don't all just work at the Department of Public Works or the Department of Transportation, but also worked, say, um, in law enforcement or in public health or with a local university and have them really uh, share, among, share learning amongst the cities, but also within the city. And then those cohorts had to get together and plan and implement a safety demonstration project. So what we're going to hear today is really from each city is going to talk about what they learned as part of the Safe Streets Academies and how they turned those into demonstration projects within their communities. So we'll start off from hearing from the city of Orlando. We'll then move on to Lexington, South Bend, and then we'll have times for questions and answers at the end of the webinar. Um, I encourage everyone to use the chat box that should be in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, and you can type in the questions. We will get those as soon as you type them, and we'll start making a queue of questions, so we'll have ample time for those. Um, this is a question that has come through, and so I wanted to let you know we are recording this webinar, so it will be available to view later. Um, so the two things that are important is type in your questions, and don't worry about taking too many notes from the slides, because we'll share all of this later on. I'd like to first start um, where we started as a Safe Streets Academy in Orlando, Florida, and today we're going to hear about the Curry Ford Road demonstration project from Billy Hathaway. Billy is currently the transportation director for the city of Orlando, but he's really a long-term friend to Smart Growth America and the National Complete Streets Coalition, uh, while he served as the champion for the Florida Department of Transportation's pedestrian and bicycle-focused and complete streets implementation initiatives when he was the District 1 secretary at FDOT. 
Um, when he's not building safer streets for the city of Orlando, he's also the chair for Bike Walk Central Florida, a nonprofit organization dedicated to safety for pedestrians and bicycles. Uh, he has a long professional background in transportation planning, street design, bridge design, safety and traffic analysis for a wide variety of transportation projects, and is really one of the one of the first people I met in this world that is committed to really turning DOTs around. Um, to creating better, safer streets for all users of all abilities. So thank you, Billy. Good afternoon, uh, Emiko. Thank you. And uh, thanks for all of you out there listening in this afternoon. I uh, hope, I do believe that uh, this will be helpful to those of you who are, all of whom are dealing with many of the same issues that, that we have here in the city of Orlando. So I'm going to go right into the slide presentation. So um, during the course of uh, after we'd been selected for the academy, uh, we sat down and talked through uh, what quarters made sense for us to uh, take into this project. And we happened to choose Curry Ford Road uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, it, it actually, uh, while it's located in the city, Orange County had jurisdictional responsibilities for it. Uh, and so it allowed us to work with the county uh, and build our relationship with them and trying to deal with the safety issues that our region has with bike and ped. And based on the volumes of cars that we have here, the quarter actually has a high level of bike and ped crashes. And also the uh, traffic volumes are such that it doesn't really warrant a five lane configuration. Uh, and finally, uh, the vehicle speeds on this quarter actually are very high when you consider the fact that, uh, that this borders residential neighborhoods. While there is commercial along the corridor, there's residential neighborhoods intersecting uh, Curry Ford Road. So you can see from this slide uh, that I've just put up, uh, on the west end, which is the left side of the slide, is Bundy Avenue, and Curry Ford Road goes from this five-lane section down to a two-lane brick street. Uh, the three streets uh, that are illustrated here, Bundy, Primrose, and Crystal Lake, are all residential streets. The length of the corridor is about a half a mile, and so what we did really was extend this two-lane road for a half a mile. Uh, and you can see the volumes uh, during the weekdays uh, run between 16 and just over 20,000. And you can likewise see uh, the crashes that we had captured within just the last couple of years. So one of the things that we learned, especially with, with such a short window, uh, because we had to get all this work done uh, and documented uh, in a very short window because of the grant schedule, which was, which was fine. Uh, so we had to go pretty hard at doing the community outreach. And so you can see on the left the flyer that we produced uh, that announced the project. And on the right-hand side, you can see a concept that was illustrated early on just to give people an idea of what this might look like. And then we have a, uh, an 11 by 17 that we used uh, for briefings uh, with the elected officials and also for meeting with the public. Uh, we had a, a, our first meeting was a, a kickoff meeting uh, in February. We had over 60 people take part. It was uh, the people that came in were really engaged. Uh, they, we basically asked them what things they liked, what they didn't like about Cory Ford Road and, and what, what would they like to see changed in order to make it better. And you can see uh, a board there where a lot of the comments were actually written by the public. And, and of course, you can see people getting questions answered and uh, talking about the quarter overall. And this is this uh, top slide just illustrates, it's a wordle that illustrates the things that were important to the, to the public. And you can see uh, most of what's on there uh, are things that Curry Ford Road does not have. And so these were things that the public said they would like to see uh, done differently with, the, with Curry Ford Road. And down below, you can see uh, a better illustration of what the uh, proposed cross section ended up being uh, as, a as a result of the public input. Uh, we installed this project between April 2nd and 6th of, of this year. Uh, one thing I do want to note is because this was a temporary project, 
Uh, we actually put temporary tape down. That's That was how we were able to put the pavement markings on. And so at the end of the project, all, all the uh, crew had to do was come back out there and pull that tape back up off the pavement, uh, which allowed us to restore the corridor to its original condition. This, this project was in place uh, for 30 days overall. Uh, you can see one of the treatments that we put in, in addition to the bike lanes, we put in a mid-block crosswalk. Uh, we also put in ADA ramps. Uh, so that uh, those who are disabled or who may have shopping carts of some sort had a, an easy way to get uh, across the street at this particular location. Uh, and then we had a second event uh, during the time that the installation was in place, and we called that our uh, Curry Ford uh, Community Bicycle and Pedestrian Safety Fair and we had over 100 people come out that day, many of, most of which were in favor, a number of folks that had concerns. Uh, the thing that was interesting is that by and large, uh, as we explained to people what the purpose of the project, this was not just about putting bike lanes out there, but by doing the road diet, which we know can reduce crashes significantly. Here in Orlando, we've had uh, a project in place for over 15 years called Edgewater Drive and the crash rates have stayed about 45 to 48% below what they were uh, before the road was road dieted about 15 years ago. And so we explained to them that there were concerns with speeding and, and we in fact saw speed reductions as a result of the project. So, so there was, uh, we had booth setups, we had the public coming, coming out, uh, we had the uh, bike share uh, that we have here in Orlando in place and along with the fire department and the police department and Orange County Sheriff's Department. Uh, and you can see here the day of the bike fair, uh, we had a lot of folks that bicycled in uh, and they really enjoyed the, uh, the way this project was set up. And as you can see, we did have a buffered bike lane and we used flex posts to help, uh, help provide uh, some visual separation along the corridor. Uh, we did a lot of community outreach, as I mentioned earlier. We did uh, briefings with the, with the commissioners, mayor, the senior staff. We, out, we reached out to 18 condos. Our staff actually walked the corridor and met personally with the businesses, either the owners or the manager, depending on who was on site. And we used social media. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we worked with Orange County, briefed them on what the plan was, uh, uh, including their communication staff. And during the course of the project, uh, there was a good bit of media uh, interest as well. So you can see that the uh, the day of the bike and ped safety fair, we uh, had a drone out uh, over the corridor. So you can see this uh, this drone's eye view of the uh, crossing. And uh, in terms of performance measures, uh, with 30 days, it was uh, tough. We I think we had a pretty optimistic view about what we might be able to catch realistically as it turns out the things that we captured uh, were illustrated here safety through livability and these are the uh, things that we were able to accomplish we did reduce uh, average daily traffic not significantly we reduce average vehicle speeds especially during the off-peak times there were some diversions to neighborhood streets uh, but not significant as, as any of you that have had any experience with construction where lanes have been closed it takes time for people to adjust to new travel patterns, and with 30 days, that's, that's a fairly heavy lift. Uh, over a longer period of time, we would expect to see uh, some of that traffic uh, move over to the toll road that's parallel to Curry Ford Road. A lot of people uh, from east and south of this area use Curry Ford Road uh, as an alternative to the 408, which is the toll road, and then they cut through those three residential neighborhood streets, which was another goal was to actually get some of that traffic, the commuting traffic back over to the 408. And then you can see the other treatments that, um, or the other re uh, results that we were able to achieve. Of course, we did have some delay, uh, but it was not uh, quite as significant as some of the people who called or emailed in uh, we had about uh, 250 emails, and we ended up with about between 37 and 38 percent of those were in favor of the project, and of course the rest were either opposed 
a large percentage were opposed or neutral, most of which were coming from outside the neighborhood area, uh, commuting in from longer distances. So we learned a lot from this project. The project was really helpful. Uh, we adopted a Vision Zero policy in the fall of last year, and we're actually working on our implementation plan for Vision Zero right now. So uh, because none of the staff had been involved with a project like this at the city in any type of road diet, uh, it was a good experience for us to learn, uh, to understand the importance of having longer and more extensive public outreach and to really prepare people realistically for what to expect when these types of changes are made. Uh, having community champions is, is certainly very important, especially your commissioners. Uh, make sure that people understand what we're trying to achieve. Uh, you know, so many people uh, thought that this was a, a bike lane project, so we need to do a better job of communicating all of the goals. Uh, and then we, we should know that there's always going to be opposition, no matter how positive the, uh, the results might be. And having data, uh, collecting data that shows what the actual facts were, uh, we saw that the delay uh, during the course of the normal, uh, this, especially the third and fourth weeks, that the delays were typically more in the five to six minute range, not the half hour that we heard from some people. So uh, people are going to exaggerate and you just need to expect that. But overall, um, from my perspective, from the city's perspective, um, in terms of our transportation department, it was a, it was a great project and we, um, we appreciate the support that we had from the other two cities. Uh, this is the team that took part, including uh, our traffic division, uh, Lieutenant Ruth, and, uh, and we're just very grateful to Smart Growth America and the National Complete Streets Coalition for the opportunity to take part in the Safe Streets Academy. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Emiko. Thank you so much, Billy. And this is uh, this has been such a great project to kind of follow the story of. As I mentioned, there we will have time for questions for everyone at the end. We see all your questions coming in, so make sure to send them. Uh, we are furiously getting them down. Uh, I also, you know, want to thank the City of Orlando for being such a great partner to work with all of this. Um, Orlando has a lot of transportation challenges, and as Billy will tell you, uh, it's the Smart Growth America's report, Dangerous by Design, consistently lists Orlando's, uh, Orlando is one of the most dangerous places to walk in America. And so having the city, having, you know, really city leadership and city staff committed to this is such an important key in moving towards, you know, less pedestrian fatalities. And they are lucky to have you, Billy, and your team, and thank you for sharing this. Next, we're going to move over uh, to hear from Scott Thompson uh, <clears throat> from Lexington. And um, so we selected Lexington, and we also visited Lexington second, because they're really a city, I think, um, undergoing, they're kind of in the middle of a lot of exciting changes. There's a lot of development happening a lot of new businesses coming to the downtown and surrounding neighborhoods. And what that brings, you know, increased people traffic and the, um, and really, you know, in a, a desire to get more people out walking and biking um, in safe conditions. Um, the project they're going to talk about, I had the fortune to just visit about two weekends ago, and they'll tell you all about it. Uh, but really it connected to this fabulous new amenity, their night market. Um, we're going to hear specifically from Scott Thompson, who serves two roles. Um, he's the senior transportation planner and the bicycle and pedestrian coordinator in Lexington, Kentucky, uh, where his work really focuses on bike and pedestrian connectivity, data collection, analysis, and updating Lexington's long-range bike and pedestrian master plan. Uh, Scott also brings a ton of enthusiasm and leadership and energy to the area, um, so it was so fun to work with him and get to know him over the six months. And with that, I'll turn it over to Scott. Um, thank you, Emiko. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we were uh, extremely excited to know that we were selected for the Safe Streets Academy and um, really enjoyed the process and really had some, some great takeaways um, in our community and, and as a team, uh, really built some, some great relationships uh, with the other cities and uh, with the Smart Growth America champions as well. So um, just, I guess, to get started, we can talk a little bit about uh, how we selected this project. Uh, we had recently 
completed an update of our bike and pedestrian master plan and had you know, hundreds of projects that um, were available to us. So uh, we looked through several of those. Um, one that we looked at was uh, a current uh, two-lane road at relatively low volumes, and we thought about taking a lane and, and adding uh, a two-way cycle track onto that roadway. Uh, it would have been a great project, uh, would have connected to a larger project that um, will be completed, uh, construction will be completed around 2020. But there were some barriers to this for the, you know, kind of the timeline that we had. Um, there were six or seven intersections would have made signalization relatively difficult uh, under the scenario and lots of stakeholder engagement uh, along this corridor. So while it would have been a great project, we, we kind of looked at, looked at some other ones as well. Uh, we had another connection uh, that we were looking at to our Town Branch Commons project. Uh, and again, it had some of uh, similar uh, barriers, which mainly were um, how could we uh, get all of that stakeholder engagement done in this short period of time, and do they really serve uh, that equitable need that we really wanted to include uh, in the placemaking component uh, of the project as well. Um, so we finally came to our project selection area, which was the intersection of Loudoun and Bryan Avenue. Uh, and we also incorporated a few other intersections that surrounded uh, the main intersection that we were, were looking at. Um, this uh, area kind of floated to the top um, because it was a great opportunity for multimodal safety improvements. Uh, we had really strong active community groups, uh, very interested in improving safety in the area. It's a very equitable area. The intersection geometry is very challenging for, for all modes as it currently exists, and so we thought that would be a, a really fun project to work through the conceptual designs uh, to lead into the, to the final design, so we, we just thought it was a really great project. And then another really key element was that we were able to engage uh, another group, which was um, a local group called the Citizens Environmental Academy, um, who had also selected this area uh, for a multimodal project improvement, and they were also able to bring an additional $15,000 uh, to the table to help um, uh, facilitate the project, and six more volunteers, which was really important uh, when we really got into that community outreach piece. Uh, so you can see here's a little bit of our conceptual work and then some of the, the final design. Um, so a little bit about the Citizens Environmental Academy. Um, it's a, a group through uh, Fayette County, uh, our Public Works Department, and Environmental Quality, uh, hosts this uh, annually. Uh, and the um, volunteers and participants um, work through a series of workshops and then uh, through a series of project ideas, and then they actually implement, implement those projects uh, based around that uh, the content of the academy. And so each participant is given $2,500 upon the completion of the academy, which enabled the six of them to bring $15,000 um, to the table. Uh, we also worked with another group. Uh, which is the uh, North Limestone Community Development Corporation. Um, they're very connected to the people and businesses in the area that we selected, um, and they've conducted an online survey for us uh, and also worked pretty diligently to inform the public about the project and share information about our two public listening sessions that we had, uh, and really we think were critical to, to, to the turnout that we had at those, at those two meetings. Um, so we started off with what we thought was a pretty robust uh, community engagement process. Our first meeting, which we had, um, was a listening session. Um, and we just wanted to hear from the folks that uh, live and worked and traveled through the area, uh, what their experiences were uh, along this corridor, uh, why they stay there, what are their safety concerns, and those types of things. So we developed a series of questions. Uh, you know, tell us where you go on foot, uh, by bike, and in a vehicle. Uh, we asked them, what are some barriers to walking, biking, and driving in the corridor? And then tell us why you stay, what makes you stay in this part of the community, what kind of businesses do you access, where do you live, uh, those types of things. And it was really, really good feedback uh, from the participants. Uh, we also asked them to look at uh, some various types <clears throat> of design treatments for bike facilities, intersection controls, crosswalk treatments, uh, sidewalk design, stormwater management, and then placemaking or kind of tactical urbanism. And we just asked them to tell us which ones they liked and which ones they didn't like by placing a series of dots on the boards. And we've seen this probably in other communities, but it, but it actually helps people, I think, uh, kind of understand some of the things that they might see um, as a result of their input um, for implementing the safety improvements. So our second meeting, uh, we did a little more community engagement this time, but we wanted to kind of talk a little bit about what we heard and then what would be some possible outcomes 
um, and design treatments from what they told us. Uh, so we basically showed them various design treatments that could be used uh, to change the dynamics of the corridor um, at the various intersections uh, that we identified at the listening sessions. And it was really, you know, the intention of this meeting was just to I explain those various design treatments. I mean, since, you know, we're, we're limited to working within, you know, um, curb to curb, and we're not really doing any really hard infrastructure, um, what you see conceptually uh, is a little bit different when you get into using demonstration project materials. So in order for us to kind of explain, you know, what it would look like, we thought it was better to show them uh, what the treatments would ultimately do for safety, but may not look exactly the way that they may expect. So we hope that that's what we were able to get across at this meeting. We did get some really good feedback uh, at that meeting as well. Uh, we also had, um, since we were second uh, in the Safe Streets Academy uh, meetings, um, we had Orlando and South Bend uh, come to town and also work on some design concepts with us. So we had that additional brain power, which really helped us uh, work through some, some concepts and, and inform uh, the final design. So after that, uh, we did some more schematic design and then kind of brought that into um, um, more, more hard line work so that we could develop uh, some, some sheet sets. Uh, we felt like uh, the project was large enough in scale that we would be better off trying to use um, a local contractor to install the project. Um, we have a, a unit price contract, and we work with a local uh, striping and sign company uh, pretty regularly. Uh, it allowed us to get the project installed uh, in about one and a half days, um, and uh, was really uh, cost effective as well. We also did some 3D visual visualizations uh, so that we could kind of go back to the public and, and show them what this would look like prior to the installation, as well as the policymakers and uh, the public stakeholders, uh, so that people just had a good idea of, of what this would look like uh, when the project was installed. Um, prior to the installation, we also uh, did a press release, um, and that led to several different radio interviews and some other um, community outreach opportunities. Uh, just to let people know, you know, why we were doing this, um, how the project was visioned, um, and what to expect. Um, and so that was pretty successful in that we did get a lot of um, contact from the media after we did the press release, and they did some really nice pieces kind of showing the project during installation and letting the public know uh, to expect some changes uh, at the intersections. Um, so we were, we were very happy with, with how the project went. Uh, we did have a few little minor drainage issues that we were able to fix relatively uh, quickly. Um, we are actively continuing to collect data around uh, these four performance measures. We had really good before data. That's another reason that we selected this project area. But we're looking at speed data, the multimodal counts, so um, all the vehicular counts as well as bike and pedestrian counts in the area, um, and then uh, collision data uh, for this particular intersection. Um, some of the, the key benefits to, to our demonstration project was it was just a very inexpensive way to implement the project uh, and evaluate it prior to making more costly permanent improvements. Uh, this is a fraction of what it would cost to do this as, as real hardscape, and we really feel like uh, it's very, um, very easy to measure the benefits uh, this way. Um, we've been able to adapt the project and make little tweaks to improve the design after the installation. Some of that was based on the public feedback that we got. Um, and then, uh, you know, Letting the public know that the project is temporary in nature uh, really eased some of their concerns. I think uh, we did get some, some pushback here and there, and when we told them that it was temporary in nature, uh, they, it was a little easier for them to swallow, and, and maybe they weren't as upset. Um, it allows public officials to see and understand the impacts of the project on the ground quickly and at a low cost. And we plan to reuse these materials uh, for other demonstration projects in the future. So there's really um, some benefits uh, to the demonstration projects. Um, Lessons learned, we really need to engage the public early and often. Um, you know, the Citizen Environmental Academy as well as the uh, North Limestone Community Development Corporation uh, were a big help uh, with this, but we still uh, received um, some input after the fact from some local businesses that they had not been contacted, and this was uh, in spite of the fact that we went door to door and, and did flyers and held public meetings and did media and everything else. Uh, we still, you know, missed a few folks or just they just didn't hear about it. So, you know, getting out early and often and, and really uh, putting that effort in. Um, finding local champions to help inform the public. So because of both of those entities um, that I mentioned previously, um, we felt like that really helped us get great turnout at our public meetings. 
uh, and inform most of the folks in the area. Um, the fact that they were non-governmental volunteers I think is really helpful because they're received a little better sometimes from the public. Um, we did have several of the local um, faith-based community as well as uh, other groups uh, host events uh, kind of celebrating the project and then we gathered feedback at those uh, gatherings and so that was really helpful for us uh, to make some modifications to the projects and also to see um, what things we got right and what things we got wrong. Um, and then re-engage the residents and businesses in the project area after the installation uh, and get their input. And that's where we found out that we had missed a few along the way. Um, but they were very cordial and they expressed their concerns and we were able to come up with some, some, some really good solutions. So with that, I will turn it back over to Emiko. Thank you so much, Scott. And really, uh, this is such a fun project to visit during the night market, which you can see on some of the slides this, um, the crossing connects to and see um, people of all ages using that. Uh, we finalized our in-person workshops in the city of South Bend, which is really doing a lot um, to change, I think, how their streets are designed to serve all users. The first time I visited South Bend, which was not actually um, this trip, but it was about a year before, they had just completed their Smart Streets initiative, which looked to redefine the role of the streets in the communities. Um, and they had turned some one-way streets into, to their downtown into two-way streets. They had added other traffic calming measures. And it's really started to transform the downtown of South Bend. And we highlighted it as one of the best complete streets initiatives of 2016. What is great is that um, the city is continuing to work on, on this. And a lot of it is due in part to Jatin Kane, who is the Director of Planning for the City of South Bend and the Department of Community, uh, I'm sorry, he is currently the Deputy Director of Public Works, but before that he was the Director of Planning for the City in the Department of Community Investment. Um, he started his career in urban planning with the city back in 2002 when he began to work on the city's first comprehensive plan that they had done in over 40 years. Um, so he has a long uh, track record of working in the city to really um, build, bring businesses, um, revitalize the downtown, and to pair this all with creating more walkable, bikeable, livable communities. So, Jatin, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Emiko. I'll start the slides. Um, just for context, for those who are here um, listening, South Bend is in North Central Indiana. We're city of about 102,000 people, and the project that we identified for this uh, Safe Streets Academy was a neighborhood traffic calming initiative. We chose a neighborhood that's just to the northwest of downtown, the uh, near northwest neighborhood, and it's a very urban neighborhood, uh, diverse population in terms of race, ethnicity, um, and uh, uh, we thought it would be a great place for us to do a traffic calming project because it's an area we receive numerous complaints from residents uh, throughout the year. Um, it's also a neighborhood that's very active in terms of a, a very engaged association. Um, and then we have uh, supportive council members. The president of the South Bend Common Council happens to live in the neighborhood. So we knew some of the stars uh, had aligned for us to get uh, this neighborhood as a demonstration area for our, our traffic calming techniques. Um, like any project, we began with public uh, feedback to understand what some of the key concerns would be for the residents. We used a variety of methods to gauge uh, public feedback. We used uh, the traditional public meetings. We did pop-up meetings. We got online feedback, and of course, the, the complaints that kept coming in also fed into our decisions on where to do what measures. Um, during the pop-up meetings, we would go to the, uh, uh, the neighborhood in the coffee shops and other areas and you'd get feedback from residents on what some of the pain points were. We brought boards with maps and we, we asked neighborhood residents to identify specific geographies or intersections where they felt there were speeding issues. We already had some of this data uh, because they, there was a history of these complaints from the neighborhood, but this allowed us to interact one-on-one, -on -one, um, listen to the neighborhoods, um, and really start to identify these exact locations. Uh, we also sent out a GIS map 
uh, link through the neighborhood listserv. Uh, this was a collector app where residents could identify uh, specific intersections where they were seeing speeding. And here, again, they could put a pin and we use this to inform our decision. Um, the public feedback allowed us to identify uh, these key locations. We chose these five locations within the neighborhood to test out a variety of uh, traffic calming measures that had never been used in the city of South Bend before. We'd never done a traffic circle or a chicane, uh, and we had done some limited bump outs in neighborhoods, although we deployed them primarily in our commercial corridors in the downtown. We'd never deployed them really in, in the neighborhood. So this was a way for us to use public feedback to identify the locations where we could use these measures. The, uh, we chose the intersection of Riverside and Hudson as one of our primary project areas. As you can see from the geometry of the intersection, it's really awkward creates a lot of speeding issues. We've had some accidents here, some near misses. The residents are really frustrated. And it gave us a uh, really good opportunity to test a neighborhood uh, traffic circle. As you can see, the geometry is really calling for one. It also, because of the, the pavement, the extra pavement we have here, we, we thought this would be an excellent opportunity to do a placemaking project. So we started with the placemaking project here, and then we identified chicanes and, um, um, and, and um, some of the other neighborhood locations for other measures. We engaged a local artist in identifying what kind of placemaking project we would do, and we came up with the idea of uh, painting the pavement with a pattern. So this is, again, um, a resident of the neighborhood, which helped us get more buy-in from the residents. Uh, the fact that this was a demonstration project, we were trying something new and using um, the local artists and the residents of the neighborhood to paint, again, help uh, build that buy-in to uh, implement the project. This was our first implementation. We, we, uh, we did this around mid-April to mid-May for about 30 days. Uh, the five projects were done for that time, although the, the rubber uh, bump outs that we use here are going to be deployed for a bit longer. The, uh, the other materials have been taken down. Um, we deployed the, the rubber curves uh, a few days prior to the public art install. And then soon after, we had the, the residents come out in a block party and help paint the street. This was an exciting event. We had our council member there, um, city staff and residents all worked together over a few hours and helped uh, really create this sort of sense of place. And we talked a lot about in our public meetings about streets as public spaces, and this was a way for us to show that we can truly uh, reclaim streets as public space. The other project and the other measure we deployed was using uh, straw logs. These are very temporary materials to uh, do a pavement reduction. As you can see in the graphic here, the intersection here is really awkward. It's a sort of a five-point intersection, and uh, we have, again, awkward geometry, uh, near misses, residents complaining about the geometry. And so we just simply did a pavement reduction by putting straw logs, making it into a regular four-way intersection. And uh, it's got uh, stop controls on all directions. And again, simple measure like that helped clarify to the public how to navigate the area. At this intersection, we just deployed a uh, traffic circle Again, this was a very simple installation. It took us 15 minutes to put these straw logs together. The cost was really low because all we did was use traffic cones and these straw logs. Um, we also put some signs, which was another important um, educational component for each of these locations where we, we identified what the traffic control measure was. We had a way for residents to uh, go online and get more information on the project, but again, to residents who were walking, but also those who were driving. This was a way to understand what the city was doing over a short time. This is an example of a chicane, again, using the straw logs. And uh, uh, one of the benefits of, of doing this project was this term chicane uh, had really never been in the vocabulary of a lot of folks in our neighborhoods, also the, the media. Uh, 
of all the things happening in the city during the time that this project was happening, the chicanes drew the most attention from the media, and we had numerous media stations reach out and wanted to do stories on what the chicane was, why we were deploying it, and as a result, we got a lot of attention on traffic calming through the uh, neighborhood, so that was a really exciting project. Like I said earlier, we, um, we kept the straw logs for about four weeks because that's really the life of their, um, their deployment. We have the rubber curbs uh, still out there, but in each of the measures that we use, we saw traffic reduction in speed in all of those locations, which was really good. Um, in some cases, we saw a higher reduction than others, but essentially in all the locations, we saw uh, speeds reduced, which was our goal. Um, some of the lessons learned, the coordination between city departments is certainly key. We need to make sure that in a project like ours, we had the public works folks, the parks department, planning, our MPO and others all working together, traffic and lighting, PD, fire, working together to make sure that something like this came, uh, came around. We also had to have a good maintenance and removal plan. We used um, uh, certain plans in some of our um, uh, installs, and we wanted to make sure that the plants didn't die, so we had to have our parks department out there to water them pretty frequently. Um, and then the removal plan, once we took the, uh, the straw logs out, we wanted to make sure we communicated to the residents that this was coming out. We held a public meeting to get some of their feedback. Um, the other important thing was uh, the materials used. We used two different kinds of materials, as we said, and each had its own challenges. The straw logs were a lot easier for us to, to move around. So as we got feedback during our install period, we were able to adjust the straw logs based on that feedback. The rubber curbing, not so much. Um, and so that was a challenge, but it still gave us a good idea of what changes uh, residents would have wanted to see. Uh, and regarding the art install, we wanted to make sure that the neighborhood was very engaged, so certainly a lot of coordination had to occur with the residents to get them engaged and, and to get them committed to come and help us uh, with the project. And, and in terms of the design, we wanted to make sure that it was very simple. Um, the, the artists started with a very complex design, and so by the time we deployed it, we knew we had to simplify it. Um, but that's really the end of uh, my brief presentation, um, and I'm going to turn it over back to Emiko. Thank you so much, Jitin, and thank you for somebody, uh, for both Billy and for Scott for joining us. We had a chance to visit this project a few months ago, and what was so fun is that when we were looking at the different traffic calming measure, measures, we actually had neighbors come up to us and tell us how, they, how excited they were for these projects. Um, I do want to remind, we're going to move to the question and answer stage of the webinar, but I did want to tell everyone that I bet you want to learn more about each one of these case studies. And if you didn't see it already, today we, uh, in conjunction with this webinar, released three case studies about these three demonstration projects where you can get into even more details about them. You received a link to the case studies in your confirmation of this webinar, and we will also send out a link to them as a follow-up. You can also always find our resources on www.smartgrowthamerica.org. So I encourage you to all go ahead, get on your computers, and download those rep that report right now. Um, to learn about what each of these three cities did. Uh, but we're going to move into really your questions and answers. If you have not done so already and you do have a question, please go ahead and type it in the lower left-hand corner of your chat box, and we will see your questions there. Um, I'm going to start with a question for all three of you. Uh, one of the questions that we got um, was about cost, and what I wanted to say that I didn't mention at the beginning is we realized that you know, as part of this, we really asked these cities to do a moonshot project. And how could they not just take what they were learning um, and go back to their cities, but actually go back and then start to apply these on the ground? So each city received an $8,000 subgrant from us to put towards their demonstration project. And in exchange, they had to either match, um, match the $8,000 in cash or in kind. Um, at a minimum, 
And the in-kind could be both, uh, it could volunteer time, it could be materials, donations, um, but each city kind of piece that together differently. And I'm going to actually, I'd like to start with South Bend and Jatin to talk about what were really the costs to get this on the ground, um, and then how long, uh, you know, how long are you going to leave this up, and do you have plans for, uh, to, to make this into a permanent installation? Uh, and with that, then I'm going to go to Scott and then Billy to answer uh, those questions. So, Jatin, can you start? I'm sure. The, uh, the overall cost for our project was under 20000 so we had the 8000 from Safe Streets, and we matched that with another eight plus some additional resources. The, uh, uh, the cost for the straw logs was very minimal. Um, that was one of the cheaper materials. I think it was about $2,000 to get all the straw logs that we ordered. The, uh, the rubber curbing was a little bit more expensive. I'm not aware of the exact cost, but we can certainly share that. The, uh, um, the plan for us is to certainly keep the rubber curving material at the Riverside Hudson location till uh, we get to the, the winter period, so about October and November, so that we can budget for uh, perhaps a full-scale, um, more permanent install next year. We are going to be talking about that in this budget cycle. We would like to do the same for the other locations as well. So. That's part of our um, uh, conversation right now, but we do plan on doing something permanent at each of the locations. Great, thank you. And Scott? So our um, total project cost was just under $43,000. Um, probably the most expensive component uh, were the uh, sure tight or quick curb style um, delineator posts and curb markers. Um, we obviously received uh, the 8000 from the um, Safe Streets Academy grant. We matched that locally. Uh, we had a $15,000 from our um, Citizens Environmental Academy participants, and then we uh, put in some other local dollars to hit that mark. Um, our contractor also did some in-kind donations as well as uh, the SureTight folks uh, discounted their product uh, because of the nature of the project uh, being a demonstration project. Uh, we plan to leave the project in uh, through the month of October. We have another project uh, down the road that we think is affecting some of the traffic patterns, and so we'd like to see what happens when that part of the roadway opens back up. Um, and as far as long term, um, you know, we, we branded this project with the intentions of trying to keep it alive after the demonstration project. Um, so, you know, we'll look to our policymakers and see how they feel about that and try to uh, move forwards um, uh, after we, we remove the project. Uh, to go through that process of trying to make um, permanent changes uh, to the intersection that we think are pretty important as it relates to safety. Great. And Billy? Yes. Um, the cost, our construction project, uh, including the curb ramps, was just, uh, just over $72,000. Uh, and our project is not going to be permanent. As I mentioned earlier, uh, while it's within the city limits, this is actually a county road, so we would have to take the county road over in order to do any types of treatments on the corridor. Great. Thank you. Um, I've got my first question just for you, Billy, um, and I'm going to ask you to answer this um, because we were still you actually received multiple questions about this, but what type or brand of tape did you use on the crosswalk, and how well did it hold up? Uh, the brand is called Swarco, S-W-A-R-C-O, and you can go to their website, swarco.com. Uh, it was down for 30 days. It held up really, really well, and, and with the traffic volume, especially with the traffic volumes that we have, uh, and including, obviously, turning movements and that sort of thing. So we were very pleased with it. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Scott, my next question is for you. Um, one of the things that we talked a lot about in the Safe Streets Academy was performance measures. And really, um, we asked each, you know, each city to take a baseline kind of performance measures and then figure out um, – and we had them develop really the performance measures they were going to collect based on the things that mattered to their communities. You know, what did the communities care most about? 
um, but then ask them to figure out how they were going to collect them, what partners they could work with to collect that data, and then really how, what was the story they were going to tell with those performance measures. And I think you did a great job, you know, starting to collect that data, uh, Scott. And could you tell us what programs or tools did you use to gather the data on your performance measures? Um, so for vehicular counts, we used just very traditional tube counters. Uh, for the bike and pedestrian counts, uh, we used cameras uh, like a MileVision type technology uh, and with a local company that we sourced that through uh, to get our uh, bike and pedestrian counts at the intersections. Um, the speed data collection, uh, we work with our local police department and we have a couple of ways that we collect that. One, we have a unit called the Speed Spy, which um, kind of is exactly what the name indicates is that you can't tell that it's in the area so people don't react to it much like they do to the uh, uh, the ones that broadcast your speed on the sign as you as you pass, uh, and so we can put that up at, at just about any location and uh, get uh, get really good speed data or, or uh, yeah speed data uh, without uh, having that influence of you know of the of people seeing how fast they're going. Um, and so those were the, the real things that we really want to look at. We also have a pretty good reporting agency for collision data as well uh, that's readily available online uh, and so that's how we'll measure our, our collisions uh, for all three modes. Um, we thought it was important uh, and we had the opportunity to leave this project in for uh, quite some time. Uh, we feel like that, that a month is great but we really felt like we needed several months um, to really notice changes in behaviors and in traffic patterns uh, associated with the project. So we're hoping that um, when, at, the, at the end of the project we'll have some, make some really good conclusions about uh, the effectiveness of what we did. That's great. Thank you, Scott. And Jatin, my question is, and I have a sense that many of you who are watching this webinar are excited to go out and do projects similar to this, like in your communities. Uh, so there were some questions about really the rubber traffic calming materials you use. Are they commercially available? Did you custom make them? Um, and if you bought them, where did you get them? The uh, uh, rubber curbing material is commercially available. We did not custom make them. Um, it's uh, engineered rubber curb. I think Quick Curb is a, uh, one of the manufacturers. There are several out there that create this uh, material. So. Um, uh, we used, a com you know, like I said, we used the rubber curvings, we used the straw logs, which were locally available, and then traffic cones. I mean, those three were the materials that we used. Great. Thank you. Um, I've got another question for all three of you that came up a lot, um, but why, you know, why for each of your communities was it important to implement short-term demonstration projects when it takes so uh, it takes people such a long time to adjust to change. Um, Billy, why don't I, we start I, with you? Or whoever that was. Go ahead, Billy. Uh, the grant cycle was what caused ours to be as short as it was. How yeah, about Scott or Jatin? Um, well, so. I mean, you know, it, it happens quickly. I mean, you know, it, it takes us a, a, a really long time to get capital projects uh, through design right away and then uh, construction. Um, and so the ability to do this quickly uh, and really measure um, the effectiveness um, really helps to inform that, that more permanent project and I think really builds uh, more consensus around the project and helps to kind of promote that, that change. A little bit, so um, you know, even if it is just for a month, I still think that there's a lot of merit uh, in how quickly you're able to move something from public outreach and public communication into installation. Um, um, that's really good for that showing people how things are going to change. I guess. And the code. This is Billy. Uh, we would ideally we would want that project to be on the ground from three to six months after we did okay. all the prep work. Great, um, Jatin. Any thoughts on this? Kind of what did you learn about having to implement it in such a short time? Um, I'd say similar to what Scott just said. Uh, one of the greatest benefits I think we got out of the project was the ability to, ability to educate residents on these new measures and also show them how they work. So that was 
reluctance for chicanes or traffic circles because they had never been done before, and us saying that, listen, this is a demonstration project. If it doesn't work, it comes off. It's like it never existed. Um, I think by showing it to them, we were able to get a lot of community support. Um, it's one thing to show a drawing. It's another to really show what the measure looks like. We have a huge backlog of complaints in neighborhoods about speeding, and uh, it takes a long time. It takes a lot of funding to install a measure. So our funding may allow us to maybe do one neighborhood a year. Something like this, a temporary measure, even using rubber curbing, might allow us to address 10 to 12 neighborhoods a year now with the same budget. And so I thought, thought that was the biggest benefit of a demonstration project. So I think that might lead into my next question for Jatan, but what are you going to do differently because of this project? Are you going to, um, is, you know, is your department going to change anything and operate differently as a result of uh, this traffic calming initiative? We already are. We uh, have already done a couple of different presentations in neighborhoods who found out about this measure and asked us to come and talk about traffic calming. Um, and so one of the things we're doing immediately is instead of taking concerns and then going into engineering, prioritizing projects and doing one, we're starting to think about how we deploy multiple projects simultaneously with the money that we have, with the, the funds that we have. So that's the one thing we're doing immediately uh, while we plan long term. We're trying to do more short, medium term solutions. That's great. Scott, how about you? Um, have you and has your community, you know, really your department and those you work with, um, do you think that the demonstration project will contribute to a kind of different way of doing things? Yeah, I think so. We are um, really looking at how to use this as a part of our neighborhood traffic calming uh, program. Uh, currently, we get, obviously, we get a lot of requests, like most communities, uh, about concerned citizens. Uh, with speeding in, in their neighborhoods, and uh, we end up with a lot of stop signs and um, speed humps. And we feel like there's a whole lot of uh, traffic calming measures in the toolbox uh, that people aren't aware of. And so similar to what, what South Bend and, and Jaten was saying is that, you know, this allows us to uh, show people on the ground as opposed to on paper um, how these things can effectively reduce speeds and improve safety along a lot of our, our local uh, collector streets. Um, and so we're hoping to incorporate that into, into that process and have started kind of discussing what that might look like and how we could offer this and really get the communities who are making these requests to champion the implementation of the project. So uh, it's kind of ongoing, but that's kind of our ultimate goal is to is how can we move that forward that way. That's great. And I'll, um, I'll also make a plug for one of the things they're doing in Lexington is actually creating like a traffic calming library. And by then, I mean they're actually going to, and correct me if I'm wrong, Scott, but actually a library of materials that communities can come and use when they want to do their own demonstration projects, which I think was uh, a really neat and fun idea. Yeah, that's definitely one thing that we, we've discussed, um, and we think that that's something that, 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 that we may uh, work towards. Um, but I, I really think that, you know, again, just being able to show people on the ground um, how these things really work uh, in a okay. short period of time and getting those local champions, really getting the neighborhoods to champion it, uh, just makes it a much easier process. Great. And uh, Billy, kind of I'm going to give you the last word on this. Uh, do you think you'll change anything or maybe the people you work with as a result of the demonstration project? Well, definitely. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're in the process of developing our Vision Zero Action Plan, and we plan to use uh, temporary projects like this to test the treatments on the corridors that we're looking to make safety improvements on before we do permanent installation so that we can make adjustments or, if nothing else, to help people see that the world will not come to an end. <laughs> Thank you so much, Phil. I think those are great last words. I want to thank the three of you again for presenting and really all three of the communities for being such great participants in the Safe Streets Academy. I also want to remind everyone that this was, uh, again, funded by the National Safety Council's Road to Zero program, and they have a next, their next coalition meeting is on June 28th, so 
uh, just a few weeks, two weeks away, actually, and we really uh, encourage you to, if you are in the Washington, D.C. area, to attend on person, but you can also join online. Well, you'll learn more about other uh, Road to Zero projects that are eliminating traffic injuries and fatalities, and it's totally free to join. Um, I also want to say uh, and encourage everyone to join the Road to Zero Coalition. There's almost 700 organizations in the coalitions, and in addition to getting a lot of information on what, um, what will be going on within the coalition and different efforts to reduce traffic injuries, um, you also become eligible for the next round of grants that they'll be offering. Um, those, the 2019 grants will open in December of 2018, and you can apply for really that moonshot project as well. Um, you can get more information at nsc.org forward slash road to zero. Uh, and then the last thing I'm excited to announce is that um, we were, a, we were uh, selected as recipients of the year two grant. Um, so you may be able to do a demonstration project with Smart Growth America. Uh, very soon, we will be announcing our Safe Street Smarter Cities Academy while we'll be bringing in some new mobility concepts into our next round of the Safe Streets Academies. Uh, in July, you will figure out more information about how to apply for this project. If you're looking for inspiration, I will remind you again to download those case studies that we'll send out in the link to you. Um, but I will also say one of the criteria for becoming eligible to apply for the Safe Street Smart Cities Academy is you're also a member of the Road to Zero Coalition. So yet another good reason to join. Uh, we look forward to seeing applications um, from all of you who are on the phone today. Um, as it closing, we will have a recap blog post that will include a recording of this session as well as a few other questions and answers we didn't get to um, where we'll have Billy and Scott and Jatin weigh in on those. Um, so stay tuned for that and as always you can reach us at www.smartgrowthamerica.org or send us an email at info at completestreets.org. Thank you very much and we look forward to hearing from you soon.